So uh, the first speaker of this morning is uh, Professor Lee Wood, that in many ways is kind of the father of uh, this revolution. Uh, he coined the four Ps and there are the kind of the guidelines uh, that is personalized and precise. Uh, so this is one P. Then of course it has the power of prediction. And because it has the power of prediction, it has also the power of prevention. And then, of course, uh, the changing spirit in medicine that uh, from the doctor that knows everything, trust me, I'm your doctor, much of responsibility for the decision is going now to the patient. And it's going to be kind of a dialogue between the patient and the caretaker, and the patient will participate. That's the participatory part. Um, a major part uh, uh, in the decision-making process of on his or her on fate, and for me, Lee Hood is kind of a hero. Uh, though we meet very rarely, I use his uh, founding work and, uh, of course, the different technologies that were introduced by him to the field, from proteomic uh, screening to genomics and so on, uh, almost daily. So, Professor Hood, the podium is yours. Well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have attended a lot of personal medicine meetings in the last 10 years or so, and I must say they often fall into two completely different categories. Those that talk about science, and that primarily will be my uh, uh, venue here, and those that get into policy and ethics, and I think that is one of the very exciting things about this meeting. In my own view, I will say, I think two events have really transformed how I think about personalized medicine. One is the Human Genome Project with its uh, delineation of human variability in 2003. And I think the second is the emergence of systems biology, which is a holistic global approach to uh, considering the complexity of biology, and I'll talk a little bit about each of those. Oh, great, thanks. So what, what I think the Genome Project and kind of systems thinking have done have led us to a view of healthcare that has as a central issue what I call scientific or quantitative wellness. And I'll, define that in some detail for you. And, and it is clear that, that uh, scientific wellness has the ability, one, to absolutely transform individual health care, and two, to deal with the transitions from wellness to disease, to deal with chronic disease in a way we've never thought about before. And we'll discuss both of those points of view. I'll give you a personal view of the uh, history. When I went to uh, Caltech in 1970 as a young assistant professor, I was staggered with the, uh, I, I was interested in human biology. I wanted to think about how we could more effectively address it, but I was staggered with its complexity. And in fact, thinking about what a doctor did typically, uh, a physical diagnosis sent out for a few lab tests, it reminded me very much of the fable of the elephant and six blind men, each feeling uh, a different part of the elephant and declaring it was a, a spear or a wand or whatever. And th that was very much what human biology was. We had very trivial measurements to deal with complexity, and that really set me off on a line of thinking, and many others as well, that uh, over the years, ended up involving uh, seven uh, different paradigm changes that dealt with complexity. And I talk about these because they frame how I think about personalized medicine. The first was bringing engineering to biology in the sense of developing over the years a series of six instruments that let us basically read and write DNA uh, and proteins. And what they did from the point of view of personalized medicine 
was for the first time give us tools that were allowed us to do high throughput measurements on human beings. And two, we began to acquire the data that led to big data and its analytics. One of these instruments, the automated DNA sequencer, got me involved early with the Human Genome Project. And of course, that project, controversial in the beginning, but uh, transformational in the end, did one spectacular thing that gave us access to the variability of human beings and the ability to correlate that variability either with wellness phenotypes or with disease phenotypes. The automated instrument uh, sequencer also made me realize that biology should be practiced in a cross-disciplinary context where a leading edge biology could push the technologists to develop relevant technologies, and they in turn could drive the development of computational tools uh, for the analysis. And together, that could analyze biology. And I moved with the help of Bill Gates in 1992 to the University of Washington to set the first such department up, and it was uh, terrifically, spectacularly successful. Uh, over its eight years of existence. But in 2000, I decided this new field of systems biology was different enough that the bureaucracy of a classic state university system was going to make it impossible to set it up in the right way. So I resigned and set up a nonprofit institute, the first institute for systems biology in, in Seattle, Washington. And of course, it took this holistic global approach to both biology and disease. And I would say one of the most important things it did was it formulated some of the basic concepts for personalized medicine. So one, it led to an awareness that you could apply the techniques of systems biology. And the two I would mention in particular are dense phenotyping of individuals. And I'll talk about that in some detail, and the ability to translate the data that come from dense phenotyping into the biological networks that mediate biology and when disease perturbed uh, cause disease. One of the second concepts that emerged from this kind of thinking, you heard about the idea that healthcare should be predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. But the essential point of that was healthcare really had two major domains. It had the domain of wellness, and in the early 80, uh, 2000s, it was largely ignored, and it had the uh, domain of disease. And actually, the sixth paradigm change dealt with wellness when we started thinking about the question of could we quantify wellness in an effective fashion? And in 2014, I persuaded 108 of my friends to undergo dense phenotyping per a period of nine months to generate longitudinal data clouds that really were revelatory in many ways, and we'll talk about those. And in fact, this early pilot program on what we came to call scientific or quantitative wellness led to the formation of a company called Aravail in mid-2015, which brought scientific wellness uh, to consumers. And, and the final step, the seventh paradigm change, was the formulation of 21st century medicine, which integrate together P4 medicine, uh, scientific wellness, and, and systems medicine, and the ability to bring it to a large healthcare system. In uh, 2015, the CEO of Providence St. Joseph's approached me and said, I'd like you to become our chief science officer and ISB, a partner uh, in research. We set up an affiliation, and that triggered changes so I'll talk about at the very end of my lecture. P4 medicine is really different from contemporary medicine. It's proactive. It's focused on individuals. It's focused on wellness as well as disease, and not just disease. It uses this dense phenotyping to assess both wellness and disease. And one thing that was really important is the idea that 
clinical trials in the future should be done in a very different way than they are today, where you take 20,000 individuals, you give half a, a, a cancer drug, half a placebo, you take the average data and you make assessments about what's going to work for the individual. And that assumption is fatally flawed, and we'll talk in detail about that. Rather, what P4 medicine would do is have 20,000 individuals, each with their individual data clouds, and you would aggregate the understanding that came from each individual into an assessment of that drug and what was necessary. And one of the things that dense phenotyping makes possible is to deal with the challenge of contemporary drugs. These are the top 10 selling drugs in the US. Today, the orange person is the responder. The best response is one in four. The worst response is one in 25. Most drugs don't do patients any good. They cost them lots of money, uh, and they expose them to dangers. What dense phenotyping will allow us to do is absolutely distinguish the responders from the non-responders. And what you can do in the future is, with a very small population of all responders, get responses that the FDI will approve. And you can cut down the cost of drugs in a major way. The project I talked about uh, with 108 pioneers in scientific wellness was done with my uh, colleague Nathan Price. And the idea here was to carry out dense phenotyping, which let us get at two of the three major determinants of, uh, of health. Uh, genetics contributing 30%, uh, lifestyle environment 60% in the healthcare system, uh, just 10%. So what dense phenotyping did then was to allow us to uh, analyze both the genetic contribution, the lifestyle contribution, and the environmental contributions, and I'll illustrate each of those. So what we did for 108 individuals was to look at the complete genome sequence. Every three months, we drew blood and looked at 1,200 analytes, clinical chemistries, proteins, uh, and metabolites. Uh, every three months, we analyzed the gut microbiome to quantify uh, the species contained therein. And we used a digital device, the Fitbit, and other devices to make quantized measurements. But the final point I'll make about the measurements that we've been involved with is wellness is really about wellness of the body, and it's about wellness of the brain. And wellness of the brain is largely ignored in contemporary medicine. So what we did was use the pioneering work of Michael Merzenich, who developed computational tools that could assess the validity of various different levels of human cognition, and then other computational tools that could enhance each of those individual types of human uh, um, cognition. And I'll give you one simple story that with a spectacular result. So uh, the Boston quarterback for football is 41 years old. His performance has been remarkable. Physically, it's remarkable. But even more so, it's remarkable mentally because a quarterback has to be able to visualize the entire field and make instantaneous decisions about what to do. So he used Merzenich's uh, computational tools for increase, increasing visual field acuity for a period of three or four years and for his reaction time. And his testimony as to what this has done for him is remarkable, as is the fact that 41 won his uh, uh, Super Bowl prize. So, so I think the brain health is really a key part of what's going on here. Together, these generated data cloud, we can analyze these data clouds, and they lead us to actionable possibilities which have acted upon increased wellness and or let one avoid disease. The actionable possibilities are all verified in the literature 
by, by bona fide analyses. We started with hundreds of those, and as we increase the data, the number has increased uh, exponentially. So for each individual, a long list of actionable possibilities, and what we then did was use wellness coaches to bring the actionable possibilities to each individual in the context of their own healthcare ambitions. And the wellness coaches were incredibly successful, 70% compliance. And in fact, they got people so enthusiastic that we ended up uh, generating the company called Aravel, which I'll speak about in just a moment. This is the very first clinical chemistries that we did on the 108 pioneers. And you can see they had nutritional, they had inflammatory, they had precardiovascular and pre-diabetic uh, failures. And all of these could be gradually corrected over a period of time. And in the nine months, we had remarkable success in that regard. For example, 53 of the 108 were pre-diabetic. Eight moved to normal, and most of the rest moved over close to normal. But uh, a, a story or two about some of the individuals. One, I was one of the individuals, and very easily, because of understanding my genetics and metabolism, I lost 20 pounds and got within five pounds of my college uh, football weight. Uh, I was able to see that I had blazingly high levels of mercury because I ate too much tuna sushi, high-end fish, and that changed when I substituted salmon for tuna completely. I had some striking inflammatory issues that dealt with diet completely, which were totally resolved, and a number of nutritional deficiencies that were genetic in nature, and those, uh, those were all corrected. But one really striking story was an individual who was a member of the 108 who came in with ankle arthritis that prevented him from photography and hiking with his wife. He had East and West Coast concierge physicians. They gave him classic anti-arthritic drugs. They did nothing. It turned out he had very high uh, levels of iron in his blood, and he had hemochromatosis. And the diagnosis for hemochromatosis, uh, the therapy is uh, bloodletting until your iron level comes down, reversed completely his arthritis. We had a second individual who'd gone into really stage three hemochromatosis. There we could stop it from regressing, but we couldn't reverse it. So early change is absolutely key. And the other striking statistic is in the 6,000 people I'll talk about, we had nine homozygotes for hemochromatosis, only three of which had the disease. Why is that not so? Obviously, blocking genes. But even more interesting, we had 45 heterozygotes, nine of which did have the disease. So you can have genes that can activate things that are present in just a single allelic form. And I suspect that's going to be true of 5,000 Mendelian recessive traits that are out there, something we'd all like to know whether we're exposed to. Aravel, as I told you, we uh, started in 2014. And today, it has 6,000 individuals. It's in all the states but one. But most important, we're beginning to see now wellness to disease transitions, which I'll talk about in uh, just a few moments. And uh, ISP is analyzing with Aravel all the data from these 6,000 individuals. And it's a remarkable data set. And I'll only talk about a fraction of the things that we've done there. And my hypothesis is these dense phenotyping, the data clouds, are really, in many ways, analogous to the Hubble telescope, which had a resolution uh, to look at the universe uh, in, uh, in such a fashion that you could formulate hypotheses about its structure and evolution. And so too do the data clouds give us new insights into human biology. For example, we've been able to demonstrate that we can use GWAS data together with the complete human genome sequences we have 
to generate polygenic scores for more than 125 different diseases. And in ways I'm not going to talk about, we've been able to demonstrate that in many, many cases, those polygenic scores are absolutely valid. And this covers all of the most common uh, human diseases, uh, cancer, uh, uh, neurologic ne neurodegeneration, um, cardiovascular, diabetes, and, and the like. But what is really exciting now is we plotted the 108 individuals on the left from lowest genetic risk to on the highest genetic, uh, highest genetic risk. And what we were able to do is compare those individuals against all 1,200 analytes that we'd analyzed in the blood. And in this analysis, we removed all individuals who had used statins, so we were looking at people that hadn't been manipulated. And here is the correlation of LDL cholesterol with increasing uh, genetic predisposition. And of course, what's interesting about this is operationally what statins do is reduce the level of LDL cholesterol and operationally, if they reduce the genetic risk of that individual for uh, high LDL uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. But what we've shown in Airvale just beautifully is if you're at high risk for the uh, LDL cholesterol and you have high LDL cholesterol, the only thing that brings it down are statins and other similar drugs. Lifestyle changes won't touch it. If you're at the other end, where you're low genetic risk and high cholesterol, lifestyle brings it down beautifully. And the important point here is knowing these genetic risk scores for many diseases is going to alter how we treat patients. We'll have insights we just didn't have before. One area that is absolutely fascinating is we can use the stratification of data across individuals from 20 to 90 uh, to begin looking at how metabolites change uh, in decades as you go from 20 to 30 up to 80 to 90. And basically what happens is you lose control of your ability to control the expression of any one of the three classes of analytes, clinical chemistries, proteins, or metabolites. And we can use that to calculate biological age. And I'll be glad to tell you how we do that. It's very, it's complicated. But what the biological age is, is the age your body says you are, as opposed to the age your birthday says you are. The lower your biological age is with reference to your chronologic age, the better health you're in. So we looked at 300 people in the Aravel population, type 2 diabetes. On average, they were six years older than their chronologic age. For cardiovascular disease, they were three years older than their biological age. And if we looked at individuals in the top 5% of Fitbit exercise, they were three to four years younger than their biological age. And we took all of the people that came into Aravel five years or more above their biological age, and we were able to show for every year they stayed in the Aravel program, their biological age decreased by one year. So my biological age is 15 years younger than my chronologic age, so I have a lot of time to do many things in the future. But the important part of biologic age is it's a metric by which each of us can assess how effectively we're aging. And we want to be able to push everyone into their 90s and above, physically alert, mentally capable, and so forth. And the final point are the state transitions, which are really uh, spectacular. And here's an example of the first one we saw, a woman in 1917, uh, uh, 2017, diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer. We had four blood draws roughly six months apart prior to that diagnosis. And what we did with each blood draw was to analyze the 2,000 people in Aravel that existed then against each of the 1,200 analytes to ask if she had 
outline and lights that indicated the kind of cancer she had. And what I can say is, with her, we found five proteins that were striking outliers, four sigma or more, uh, that none of the other individuals had. Three of the five proteins could be explained beautifully in terms of roles they could play in cancer. The other two, uh, we just uh, didn't know. But we were also able to look at disease-perturbed networks, and we saw exactly the same thing. As you got closer to the diagnosis time, an exponential increase in the number of disease-perturbed uh, networks. So what we think we can do now for each individual is assess their wellness through this uh, dense phenotyping, and that at every blood draw, we'll look at them with regard to analytes that are outliers, or disease-perturbed networks, or correlation networks, or, or certain dynamics that I'm not going to talk about. But the question is, what's signal and what's noise? We're going to have to gather a lot of data. We're going to have to do a lot of correlations downstream. But in 10 to 15 years, I think we'll have markers that will allow us to see virtually every major chronic disease when it transitions at its earliest point in time. And we'll have then the capacity to think about therapies that will reverse that. So the exciting ideas in the future, can we eliminate most chronic diseases before they ever manifest themselves as a phenotype? And of course, that is going to be the preventive medicine of the 21st century. A, the ability to see the transitions, B, to uh, and develop biomarkers that mark the earliest transition and give us then the ability to interrogate the disease-perturbed disease networks for therapeutic uh, counters. And of course, this, as I said, is going to be the preventive medicine of the future. What is interesting is this gives us an entirely new view of how we should study disease. We should see it as an absolute continuum from wellness to disease. We should be able to identify the transition at the earliest point. And for two or three different diseases we've looked at, that's long before you see any phenotypic manifestations of the disease. And if you can reverse it before it ever manifests itself, that's where we want to go. The irony with contemporary medicine is 98% of the studies are at the far end of the spectrum after things are really complicated and even if you design really great drugs that correct some disease-perturbed networks, there are 30 others you still have to deal with. You can't reverse disease uh, at an end stage. And that's really true for Alzheimer's. And I'm going to get back to that in uh, just a moment. So it is a complex disease. And what is interesting about Alzheimer's is its history is absolutely incredible. They've had about 400 clinical trials in the last 12 years. Zero have worked. It's really quite remarkable that pharma goes on spending billions of dollars on things that just aren't going to work. And the latest failure was a week or two ago. And it, it was, again, using drugs with the same kind of hypotheses that had failed uh, 15 times over. So what we've done is said, let's put together three paradigm changes. Dense phenotyping, a multimodal therapy that is pioneered by a systems view that I'll describe in just a moment of Alzheimer's, and then put it together with these cognitive brain training exercises uh, I talked about uh, earlier. We put together a strategic partnership. And what's true about Alzheimer's is you can die Really? OK, let me, uh, let me go through this in the next part, and we can start the discussion. OK. So Alzheimer's can be detected about four to 10 years before clinical diagnosis now. And we're going to use the data clouds to be able to identify the points in individuals for doing that. The, multimodal, uh, and that will give us the stratification of the disease into its different types as well. 
the multimodal therapy is optimizing synaptic communication by using 36 different uh, manipulations, a very complex adaptive therapy, different for each individual that has had some enormous preliminary success, especially when put together with these cognitive training things. We have a clinical trial that's been ongoing for a year now, and the early results look really well, and we'll be starting several other clinical trials afterwards. We've set up a company that is creating expert systems called Consilience, and it has the ability to think, in a sense, like a human being does, as a contrast to, to taking lots of data and using machine learning to make statistical assumptions about things. And it's really solved the problem of expert systems by deconvoluting disease into a hierarchical series of concepts uh, about what the disease is and being able to bounce these concepts off the patient's uh, actual uh, data and so forth. So it's a triumvirate. Consilience works on individual patients in an N of 1 kind of experiment. They're fed through ISB uh, using traditional machine learning techniques and uh, converting them to hypotheses about the disease and so forth that can then be fed in a continuously learning system to improve the diagnostic area. What's nice about the intelligent Legos that represent the conceptual formulation of each disease is they provide an open box so any physician can see exactly the logic that was used to make the diagnosis uh, or to formulate the therapy. And here's an example of the system and operation where we've looked at the concepts and then fed the patient's data in, and the patient's data is bounced off those concepts. And that ends up being then formulated as a series of hypotheses that deal with diagnosis on the one hand uh, and deal with therapy on the other hand. And we've done this for Alzheimer's, for sepsis. We're just beginning to do it for uh, genetic variations in the genome. And all of this we're beginning to apply to uh, Providence St. Joseph's. So I'll stop. You can ask questions. That's a lot of science.